Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Hinkin. I'm the founder of the Humane Space. Again, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, for, the, for those of you who aren't too familiar with us, our, our mission is really to encourage and prompt a daily practice of, of curiosity, wonder, and awe. Um, if you're not currently signed up for our um, weekly email and newsletter where we announce talks like this, um, I encourage you to do so on our website at www.thehumane.space. Um, and if you've missed any of our previous conversations, you can find them on our YouTube channel, which is at The Humane Space. Tonight, um, we're talking about um, our true selves, what that means, why it's important, um, and how to find our true selves. Um, our guest is Dr. Rebecca Schlegel, a professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Texas A&M University. Dr. Schlegel is co-director of the Texas A&M Existential Psychology Collaboratory and an associate director of the Texas A&M um, Institute for Technology-Infused Learning. She holds a PhD from the University of Missouri, Columbia um, and a bachelor's from Kansas State University. Um, she studies issues related to self-identity, authenticity, and meaning of in life. Much of her work has focused specifically on the idea of a true self um, and the ways in which people use beliefs surrounding their avowed true self to imbue their life with meaning. Um, I have really been looking forward to this talk um, for so long because so much of what we do um, and what we're building at the humane space revolves around finding your, your truest self. We definitely believe that lifelong learning is a way to find one's truest self. And it's the foundation of really everything that we're, we're doing here. Um, and I'm just going to, there we go. Um, okay, great. And a little bit about the format for, for this talk. Um, we like at all in all of these conversations to be as conversational as possible. So feel free to ask questions in the chat at any point. Um, if we're talking about something that is of interest to you, I'll, I'll try and pay attention as we're talking. Um, if there's any questions in the chat and ask them while we're talking about that topic. Um, of course, we'll leave time at the end of the conversation for you to engage um, with Dr. Schlegel as well. Um, there's also a live transcription button on the bottom, um, which you can utilize too, um, if needed. Um, we are recording this, but you, the top um, squares on the top of your screen will not show up in, in the video. Um, and, and finally, uh, one last thing, we're, we're not just here to talk and have you listen. We want these events to be open conversations, opportunities to ask questions, engage, and learn with experts. And I encourage you to participate as much as you feel comfortable um, doing. Um, so welcome to Dr. Schlegel. It's so nice to have you um, in our space. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm super excited about this. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. First, can you just share and talk about your work and, and why you chose these areas of research? Yeah, so uh, the truth is I really fell into this by accident. Um, I actually went to grad school uh, with the intention of being a social psychologist because I wanted to study like intergroup relations and prejudice and stereotyping um, and things like that. And while I'm still very interested in those topics, um, I kind of, you know, fell into this uh, other topic uh, while I was in grad school. And it really came from a conversation that I was having with, at the time, my fellow graduate student, now uh, husband Josh. Um, and we were talking about, uh, we were in this personality psychology class and we were talking about different models of personality. And we were talking about how one of them really had no explanation for the idea of a true self. And so, you know, just were like, you know, what did that make us think? And I, and I said something kind of flippantly, well, you know, I don't think people have true selves. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't have a problem with that. And so I think Josh said, well, that's crazy. Like, and then, let's talk about, let's talk about that. So we, 
we came up with this study we were going to do that was going to show um we thought it was going to show how people uh kind of took how they were feeling when they were in a good mood and kind of infused this all this extra meaning and that was where the true self idea came from and it was really just this illusory thing uh, those studies never worked <laughs> uh, they never worked instead what we found kind of over and over and over again was that the more people felt in touch with their true self and we operationalized that a number of different ways but the more people felt close to their true self, felt like they knew their true self, the more they um, felt like they were accessing their true self, uh, the more meaning they reported, uh, the more confident they were in their decisions, the more satisfied they were with their decisions and so forth. So we just kind of kept pulling that thread and kind of going down this totally different path than where we started. <laughs> um, and, you know, I kind of still say I'm a little bit of a, I'm like a true self agnostic on what the truth of, of the matter might be, but I think true self beliefs are really important. And I, um, I think they're also, uh, you know, I do have some other thoughts that have evolved over time about what that might be. But I definitely started as like a skeptic. <laughs> um, I have now moved to a more complicated place, I would say. So um, let's dive a little bit into like, what, what is the true self? How do you define what that is even? Yeah, so as I mentioned, a lot of our work is really focused on like what uh, people think the true self is. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of different, you can find a lot of different theories in psychology about what the true self may be. Some uh, downright dismissive, uh, some where it's, you know, the most important thing, you know, you can really find the whole gamut. Um, and so where we started for a while was, okay, like, let's kind of put that question aside about the truth of the matter. And let's look at what people think, just not psychologists, but everyday people like what are the ways that people understand themselves um and so you know what we found are you know a pretty common set of beliefs you know that people think the true self is who you really are deep down kind of um i think like the you know there's like the your essence right it's like who you know what makes me becca what makes you lauren you know and then it might be like um you know, if you were to take us and even if we've been born at a different time or in a different country or under different circumstances there's like this feeling there's a part of us that would still be the same, even in these like radically different circumstances. And I think people kind of think of it like with the onion metaphor, you know, like if you peel away all these layers, uh, there's something in there, like the essence of who you are. So that that seems to be what people think. Um, and to me, I think that's actually a little bit rigid, you know, like I think that's a part that I'm still a little bit skeptical about the idea that there's like a set of features that makes you who you are and you can't change them. Um, and they would be the same no matter what happened to you or where you were. Um, I think that's the part that I'm still a little skeptical about. You know, I think that probably the what the true self really is to the extent that there is a true self is more like um, a relatively common set of psychological needs actually. You know, that uh, we think our true selves are what make us different, but in some ways I think the true self, our true self might be what makes us similar, you know, that we have these same basic psychological needs. And, and I really like this theory called self-determination theory, which says, you know, we all have these needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So we want to feel that we can freely choose our behavior. We want to feel that we're effective in the things that we do, and we want to have close, meaningful relationships. Um, and, and it's really, you know, our situations and our circumstances that are more or less supportive of those of those psychological needs but when those psychological needs are fulfilled we're able to kind of integrate and come up with this uh you know we we get in touch with our growth tendencies and we get like a uh, we get like a fully functioning self so to speak you know when when those needs are fulfilled so i think i've kind of come around to i think the true self is something more like that so rather than the onion uh metaphor so to speak and you know it's it's being able, I mean, it's what I love about your approach to like lifelong learning. I think that's a big part of it. You know, it's about exploration um, and doing these things that fulfill our needs, um, you know, so we can get that integrated, more nuanced version of who we are. You know, that we're not just necessarily one thing, you know, we might even be a collection of puzzle pieces that kind of fit together in different ways. Yeah, I, I guess that question of like, are we born with our true self? Right, yes, <laughs> or exactly. Is that something that we actually craft over time um, is a fascinating concept to me. I guess I've always thought of it as like, I have to discover my true self. Yeah. Um, 
and and thinking like it's it's embedded in me and I have to search through yes, the yes. murky waters to, to find it. Um, yes. But I guess um, you know that that gives me something really interesting to think about that it's it's in process really potentially throughout life. Um, so like when people talk about like who I am, yeah. who I am as a person, um, is that aligned like perfectly in your view with like the true self, or is yeah. is there some difference there? Do you think? Yeah, that's a, it's such a great question, and I think this is where it can get. Um, a little bit tricky. Like you said, you know, I think people have their avowed true self, right? That's who they think they really are. And I think, um, I think there is a sense in which we can be kind of right or wrong to, to some extent, right? Because I do think, um, you know, society can kind of trick us <laughs> um, sometimes into thinking that we have certain values that I'm a little skeptical or are actually indicative of anybody's true self, like wealth or fame or some of these things, right? At the particularly at the cost of things like personal growth and meaningful relationships and autonomy and competence, these more basic kinds of needs. So I think I do think, you know, I that's where it's my feelings about this are a little bit complicated, you know? Like I yeah. you know, like I don't think it's just this one thing that you have to find. But I do also think there's a sense in which it could be wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like I do think it's it's more complex and multifaceted than we give it credit for sometimes, but but um, you know I, I do still think you can be wrong potentially about about <laughs> it if that makes sense. It it totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, so so here's probably the question of the night. But uh, yeah. why does finding your true self matter? Yeah. So we find over and over again that. Um, you know, feeling like you know who you are, feeling like you have self-knowledge, uh, it's just incredibly important. I think it's the foundation for finding meaning in life. You know, I, I really do. Like, we just find it over and over again that like, um, you know, this kind of this compass metaphor, I think people are using their beliefs about who they are to imbue the rest of their life with meaning, right? So if you ask me, why am I a social psychologist, right? If I say, well, it's because my parents wanted me to, which is not true, but if I say it's because my parents wanted me to, or uh, I thought it would make me a lot of money or I didn't know what else I was going to do. Like none of those are like, feel very meaningful, right? But if I can, if I can find the way in which it's congruent with my deeply held values or my, uh, my skills or whatever, you know, if, it, if it's something that's coming from me and it's like an actualization of those things, um, that's where meaning I think comes from. And I think we do the same thing with our relationships, our hobbies, kind of any aspect of life, right? It's like, it's why is this a meaningful thing to do? Well, it's because it's congruent with who I am, right? And and we call this the true self as guide lay theory. And I think it's intuitive to a lot of people. I think it's something that, you know, we even like subscribe to, right? Um, that said, I think you can, I think this mechanism can kind of get tricked and take you off the scent, so to speak, right? Again, society might tell you. <laughs> um, that you wanted to pursue X, Y, Z, or, 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 you know, you, you might have a trauma or there might be things that kind of take you off, um, kind of off this path. Right. So I think this mechanism can get tricked. So I think it's best when we have, yes, the good narrative, but it, it really is also congruent with our more basic growth motives and basic psychological needs. Right. Like when it really is in the pursuit of these more intrinsic kind of things, like, growth and relationships and and not uh, I'm picking on wealth and fame but those are easy ones you know wealth and fame uh, um, or appearances or trying to impress other people right yeah you know I I have I I have never tied um sort of my true self or mm -hmm. knowing myself to meaning in life yeah. but it it's it's their natural partners yeah you know when you take a moment to, to really think about yeah. it um so yeah, that that's it's great. It's um it's a great connection there to make. Also, um, when when do we begin this journey of of finding our true selves, and does that process ever stop? Like even if we're not like consciously thinking about like you know, I'm I'm following my passion, you know, right now, or I'm following this interest. So so yeah. when does it? When do you think it starts? And and yeah, how long I, does it continue? Yeah, I have a, you know, I think there's a couple of different ways to think about that question. One thing that I think is really interesting about this question um, 
that's slightly different than I think what you're asking, but I'll come back to what you're explicitly asking, which is that um, one of my very favorite um, psychology papers, uh, it's by Roy Baumeister, is called How the Self Became a Problem. And the idea in that paper is that if you look historically, um, the idea that we need to find ourselves, the idea that, or even that we need to create ourselves, the idea, the problem of identity is a pretty recent historical phenomenon, right? Uh, because society, you know, supplied the answer um, for most of history. You didn't really have a choice um, about what you were going to do, right? You were a shoemaker because your father was a shoemaker or whatever. You were a Catholic because everybody was a Catholic. So the question of even of selfhood is like a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. It's kind of like with the, with the, with, you know, great freedom comes great responsibility or whatever, right? Like with the freedom to make those choices, um, we both get the opportunity and the challenge um, of figuring out who we are, right? Because now there is that opportunity that we could be wrong, right? So it's both, you know, from an existential perspective, right? It is both exciting and scary um, to, have, to have that freedom, right? Because uh, the question of meaning, you know, again, was it meaningful for me to be a shoemaker might not have crossed people's minds because there wasn't the option to do something else, right? Um, not to say that people didn't have meaning, but I'm just guessing, it, you know, it was coming from more constrained places uh, like relationships, you know, and things like that. Um, so, but we're in modern times. So the different question is, what are we dealing with? And I think, um, you know, I'm not a developmental psychologist, but I think there's like two probable kind of ways we start thinking about these things. I think one is, uh, you know, I have two young sons and I, at a very early age, people already start asking you, <laughs> society starts asking you who you are. Society starts asking you to, what do you think you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> what do you like to do? Um, are you into sports or are you into scouts or, you know, whatever, right? Society asks you to start making those choices at a pretty young age. And so I think even if, you know, my seven-year-old, I think his grappling them in a grappling with these questions in a less sophisticated way, but those seeds are being planted, right? About thinking about those things. I think also people have said, you know, I think around age four or so is when people realize that um, thoughts and behaviors aren't always congruent, that people can lie, <laughs> basically, you know, that you can <laughs> say things that are different from what you're thinking. You know, at a, when before about four, that doesn't occur to kids, right? And so I think also the idea that behavior and thoughts don't always match is another trigger for starting to think about these things, right? Um, and that I might be able to present myself differently than I really feel. So like, like questions of authenticity and who I am and am I being truthful? I think all those things start pretty young, um, but they just get more complicated and more sophisticated um, as we get older. And, and to me, the journey is never done. I think, um, to me, I think a, a huge part of how we think about who we are is like our life story. And like the life story is, is always changing, right? It's always updating. And I think we're using kind of the language of the true self to make sense of that story, right? And so I think sometimes, for example, when things don't go well, we say, you know what? I mean, that was when I realized that's not who I was. I wasn't, you know, like if someone changes a career. I wasn't a psychologist, but, you know, I was really a farmer. I don't, you know, whatever. Like I figured, I kind of figured that out. Um, and so I think it's, it's never over. Cause I mean, we're always in these different stages of life, parenthood, marriage, you know, caretaking or parent, whatever, right. It's always changing. And we're faced with new challenges that are also growth opportunities. Right. So that's, that's what I said. So, yeah. Um, so when, when maybe we don't have a full view of ourselves, or maybe we're in the early stages of that mm -hmm. discovery process, how do we navigate, you know, the challenges that we face in life? Like, um, you know, you, you, in your TED talk, you talked about how finding your true self is almost like your, this compass that you can refer to. And I, I, I so loved that, that yeah. concept. Um, because I, when I am faced with a challenge, I don't necessarily think about, you know, my, my true self as, as mm -hmm. guiding me through that difficulty. So can you talk a little bit about what are the, what are the factors? What, how, how does, how does all of this get resolved when we face life challenges? Yeah, I think, and I think challenges are like a really interesting place where sometimes we 
uh, I think it can go a few different ways, right? Because sometimes we feel like the compass is what gets us through. Like I had my ex, you know, that like really got me through this thing, whatever that might be. I had my faith, I had my um, my career, I had my partner, whatever like it might be. But then sometimes we go through challenges that threaten our views of who we are, right? They might even shatter our assumptions of who we are, right? You know, I was just talking today with um, someone going through a divorce who was saying, you know, like, I'm questioning the past 20 years, you know, did, was any of that real, right? Was any of that real and had, was, did I lose myself? And now I have to refine myself, right? And so um, I, I think it, you know, it really, like both of those things can happen, right? Like it can help us navigate stormy waters if things go well, but sometimes it can also shake, you know, kind of the foundations of that we've kind of built our selfhood on you know and that that could be tricky to navigate right <laughs> yeah completely I, I mean do you think that um uh most people think that that following their true self their true self leads to satisfying decisions mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that we definitely find over and over again and we find uh people uh, people will, you know, they, they agree. If you ask them that question, they agree with it very strongly, but, uh, but also you can see the downstream consequences. So we'll do little, you know, experimental manipulations in the lab where we temporarily make you feel like you know who you are or kind of temporarily make you question whether you know who you are. So, so like one example that, um, from some of our older studies, we did this with a Texas A&M students, you know, we did the, these little experimental manipulations that social psychologists do that kind of again, kind of affirm that you know who you are or make you question who you know who you are. And then we said, you know, how happy are you came, that you came to A&M? And just even getting people to temporarily question who they were led them to question whether they were happy they came to a &M. And I don't know how much you know about A&M, but students are kind of, you know, it's like the home of school spirit. So getting people to question um, that decision uh, was like really kind of remarkable to us. And we found the same thing with uh, their major kind of, and these were college freshmen. So we asked them like their decision to like join a fraternity or sorority or not. You were trying to get different domains, relationship domains, kind of the college choice. But we over and over, we see that effect that if you can um, kind of affirm or lead people to question, it kind of, the next thing, like you said, that meaning and selfhood are these natural partners. So if I can get you to question the compass, you know, then you question where you, where the compass led you. Right. Um, and we find the same thing, even uh, we find like what we call like framing effects. So even if we start with the decision, so we say, OK, think about your choice to come to A&M. Now I want you to go back and think about how you made that choice using your true self or how you made that choice using something else, even things like rational thinking, like being really logical or advice you got, even things that people think aren't bad things. Right. Well, like say, think about that we'll see that even just framing a decision as being in line with the true self leads to greater decision satisfaction. Even in this kind of, uh, again, it's kind of just a narrative that you're talking about afterwards, but even those kinds of framing effects, we see the same thing. So I think, again, speaking to that idea that like identity and meaning are just these like natural partners. So they, they again, like not even saying you didn't use your true self, but just focusing on how you made the decision logically, um, as opposed to thinking about the true self, um, just isn't as affirming as thinking about selfhood. So I guess the flip side of this is is when people regret decisions yeah. that they've made. Yep. Do you think that they often feel that they have not either been able to refer to that compass mm -hmm. that we're talking about, or they chose not to? For some reason yep and i think the common thing that we see there is one of two things either um you know i made a mistake and didn't follow my true self i i listened to uh somebody else or i you know i kind of I, I, I let myself got, get taken off the path or um i had a mistaken idea about who i was and i've now figured out that i was wrong about that right like something happens that so i think it's like one of those two things either like beliefs about the self are updated, um, or um, there's a recognition of like, a feeling at least of not having followed the true self in those decisions. So I think what, when I think about this, th this question of the true self, I often think about it in the context of 
personal decisions, you yeah. know, who, who to marry, who yeah. to, what profession to go into. But, um, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I was also really interested in is, is how this impacts our professional lives, mm-hmm. not just our personal lives. And I know you've done some interesting research with students, so it would be great to hear, hear your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's huge. I mean, kind of career choice has been one of the um, places that we spend a lot of time, in part because I think in this time of, in history, again, we, derive, we do often derive a lot of meaning from our careers, right? It is a place where, or at least a lot of people are looking for meaning in their careers. Um, so, so I think there's a couple of things. One, I think, um, again, is finding that meaning through selfhood. So there's some interesting studies not done my, by myself, but that I just really love that um, people can find, uh, like, I don't, I'm not convinced that like particular careers are like inherently more meaningful than others. Um, it's about kind of how you're framing them um, and how you see yourself in them. So for example, uh, one of these studies that I love is about how, um, you know, like custodial staff at hospitals sometimes report as high of meaning um, as you know the doctors, right? Because they see um, if they can see the value of the work that they are doing for the functioning of helping people get better, right? Um, and mm-hmm. so I think it's all about you know there's like this meaning potential in so many different things, right? And so um, again, finding finding that thread, finding that narrative where like again this is expression you could imagine then someone saying well this is the expression of my values that it's important to help people in their time of need and part of that is cleaning up the room you know part of that is giving the people uh, space to do those things so um, I think when you can find that connection um, that's kind of where the magic is uh, so to speak but uh, but then we also know from work uh, again in self-determination theory which is like one of my favorite theories that doing things that really are in line with your values and your uh, kind of intrinsic um, desires and motivations um, really does help you accomplish those things. So you have more energy to do those things. You're more motivated to do those things, um, all of which makes you more likely to actually attain your goals. And, and you know, they operationalize that in slightly different ways. Um, you know, that congruence, uh, they measure that in a lot of different ways, but it always comes back to that same basic principle that doing things that are congruent, again, with this deeper self that I think is, might even be relatively content free, you know, in terms of like, are you an artist or are you this? But it's more about, again, finding those growth potentials, the intrinsic motivation, those kinds of things. Um, And I think uh, I also read about one study that you did with students who said that when they felt more confident about who they are, who who their true self is, that they had less of a motivation loss. Yep. I was really curious about that. Um, yeah. Could you, yeah. Yeah. Can you describe that? Yeah, absolutely. That? So that one, one of the things that I loved about that study was we didn't even ask about, so these were students that we were following over the course of a semester. And we know, I can say this as a professor, uh, you know, over the course of a semester, academic motivation goes down. <laughs> you know, the first day of class, uh, you know, we're about five weeks deep into my, the semester and attendance is going down in my class, you know, as it just does, right? I mean, everybody's there the first week and then it, uh, you know, it just motivation wanes. But we found that that decrease um, was, you know, attenuated, it was basically flat for people who had really high feelings of self-knowledge. And in that case, we weren't even asking, you know, is being a student consistent with that self-knowledge? It was just, do you feel confident <laughs> that you know who you are? And again, we were we were kind of taking that a leap, I guess, to think though, that like, if you feel really confident that you can read the compass, you know, you're able to find the meaning in what you're doing. You know, you're seeing it. And again, that, that might look very different person to person. Maybe being a student is meaningful because it's going to allow you to help your family. Maybe it's meaningful because you just want to learn. Maybe it's meaningful because, you know, this is what you've wanted your whole life or you're, uh, you know, you're in all these amazing um, friendships. I mean, there's so many different ways that that could look different from person to person, but I think you're going to be better equipped to see that meaning when you feel, again, confident that you can read the compass, basically. I mean, it seems like we have so much more, sometimes maybe I should say so much more opportunity 
in school to kind of um, investigate these areas, yeah. you know, um, especially yeah. if, if you go to college. Um, and I'm curious about, you know, adult in the adulthood per, mm -hmm. in professional life, um, because things, those questions, I think, seem to kind of fade away as you start working in, in a job. And I'm, I'm curious if you have the sense that if, if employers encourage that a little bit more, encourage that self-discovery process mm -hmm. in, in the workplace, do you think that that would impact motivation in, in the workplace also for adults? Hey. Yeah, you know what's so interesting is that way back, uh, like uh, in the days of doing my dissertation, um, that was kind of like one of the most common um, kind of pieces of feedback that we got was like, well, you see these effects because you're looking at college students, uh, go get some adults. And you know what we actually found was that it was even more important for adults. <laughs> so uh, like the kind of the correlations that we saw between um, for example, self-knowledge and decision satisfaction or just general meaning in life were even stronger for adults. And that was not necessarily what we expected. And I, our kind of, uh, you know, post hoc uh, interpretation of that data was, well, actually when you're in college, it's still normative to be figuring it out. <laughs> um, and by adulthood, you're supposed to have figured it out. And so feeling less competent in that self-knowledge is actually potentially even more distressing um, than it is in college. And mm -hmm. so um, that's why I do think it is like this lifelong journey. Now, do we get so busy that we maybe don't have the time to devote to it? Right, I think that's a different issue, but I don't know that it actually becomes any less consequential um, in our experiences. I mean, if you just think about even like, you know, midlife crises uh, or the kinds of things that people go through. I think a lot of those are rooted in identity concerns, right? Yeah. That that not feeling confident um, about who we are. Uh, fascinating stuff. Um, if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. I have a few more, which I think yeah. are, are, these are some of my favorites. Um, so um, to what degree, is it important that other people know mm -hmm. our true selves, like to feel like our true self is known by our families, our partners? How does that how does that impact us? Do you think? Oh, I think this is really important. In fact, there's um there are a couple of different um, kind of predominant models of authenticity out there, and. and and kind of relational orientation or people call it different things is, is usually baked in there. You know, it's like the feeling that you are known by people close to you and, and that your relationships are built on this kind of, you know, authenticity both ways, you know, that you know that person's true self and they know your true self. And uh, one of my graduate students, uh, Grace Rivera, she um, has a paper that just came out a couple of years ago where we found um, that uh, feeling, we were studying this, concept I sharing, which is just like feeling like you're sharing a subjective experience with somebody else. So it's basically like, if I watch a movie with my partner, do we laugh at the same time? Like, am I feeling like we're having this um, shared subjective experience? And, and that was known to be important for relationship satisfaction. But we found that the, the, the reason, like one of the mediators, psychological mediators, as we say, um, of why it promoted relationship satisfaction was it made me feel like my partner knew my true self. Right, like when we share this subjective experience, it made me feel known. Um, and, and we asked about a different kind of parts of the self, like your true self, your actual self, your ideal self, um, and kind of over and over again, it was really the true self kind of pulling that psychological um, weight, uh, promoting um, relationship satisfaction. And so uh, I think it's just like, it's so important. And I think you know, I mean, imagine, I think that's what, you know, again, this person I was talking to, that's like the first thing that comes up when a relationship dissolves, right? Is it was like, was that person, was that, was the stuff we went through, like, what, were they being real? <laughs> um, was, was any of that real, right? Like, that's the thing that happened. So I think it's, you know, it's foundational. I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of like how meaning, like we said, meaning and selfhood. I think this is just like the meaningful part of relationships, right? You, you brought up earlier in our conversation, like, you know, um, 
sometimes people sometimes people lie um, or uh, I'm curious about like uh, to what degree we keep our true selves hidden yeah. I, I don't know if there's ever if there's been any research on that but I'm yeah. just really um, curious about that yeah absolutely there's definitely research about that and I think there's, you know, huge individual, unfortunately, we kind of have to rely on self report, which is kind of a yeah. problem. So like how I, I can't like, hold a thermometer up and say, like, <laughs> is this person being real right now? So we, we do kind of have to rely on self report. But, but even with self report, there are like these individual differences and in how authentic people think they are being in their lives, you know, how much they think they're showing their true selves to other people. And you can do that in general. You can do it at a specific level, like how authentic were you being in that situation? Um, how authentic um, are you in this particular relationship? And those things vary. In fact, um, a lot of work now is showing that it varies much more situation to situation than it does person to person. So um, so like we recognize that we're more authentic in some situations than others. And we're kind of we're registering that you know, and I think it predicts <laughs> how meaningful those things feel, how satisfying those things feel, right? We know that when you feel authentic in the moment, it also uh, kind of turns on your approach motivation. So going back to goals also, like when something feels authentic, you want to do more of that thing, right? Um, it it kind of activates uh, our approach motivational systems, as we say. And so uh, I think I threw a lot of different concepts out, out there, you. But but yes, we are interested in that question too. Like, how much are we, ex or at least how much do we think we're expressing our true selves, and, and how much does that matter? And it does. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I almost feel sometimes like when you have one of those experiences where you, um, where either you're discovering a part of yourself or mm -hmm. you're connecting with that part of yourself, that there's some kind of endorphin <laughs> release yeah. or something like yes. um that happens where there's a physical actual physical sensation um sure. so uh, another no, I think, uh, yeah I think, like, not to interrupt you but i think like um a self-determination person would say that's that you know they have a fancy word for this that's your organismic valuing process you know it's a sign coming from within you about what is meaningful to you it, it is a cue right and part of discovering is to pay attention to those cues rather than again I think these like societal pressures or societal messages about what you should be doing it is like that that tingly good feeling I mean I know what you're talking about right that's I think that's yeah. a real thing and so again when I say I'm a true self-skeptic I'm skeptical of the idea that there's just like uh, you know like you're extroverted you know like Becca's true self is extroverted I, I don't think it's that kind of stuff it is this more a little bit amorphous uh kind of thing where it's like oh yeah I'm doing something that really feels me right now uh, and it might even be hard to put into words right but that you can kind of find those patterns so like when we decide to change course or change mm -hmm. career or leave a relationship um, is that in part because we've either lost course or because we're finally writing the course? Yeah. Or um, or does it just is it just messy and it just depends on? Yeah. Yeah. My guess is messy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could be any of the above. Any of the above. You know. I think. Um, like I think people sometimes use this example of. Uh, you know, like maybe you go to law school for ideals, right? You went because you wanted to help, um, but then you kind of get caught up in climbing the ladder. You get caught up, right? You knew, I mean, I think the same thing can happen to academics. I think we all go into this because we wanted to solve a problem or help with something. And it's real easy to get caught up in uh, deadlines, <laughs> um, yeah. just publishing papers for the sake of publishing papers. Uh, you know, we can, uh, we can lose touch with those, things right and so I think uh, we can get off course but we also might figure out that we were wrong again like think about maybe the bad relationship or the, um, these other kinds of things where we figure out oh you know what <laughs> that wasn't I thought this was what I wanted <laughs> um, I thought this is who I was turns out I actually there are some other things that are pretty important to me <laughs> um, and I didn't know it yet right so it could be that you kind of lose sight of the things that you felt were important to you or you hadn't yet learned those things that were important to you you know um 
So I'm just going to keep talking because I don't yeah. see any questions in the chat. So I have more. Um, yes, uh, yes. But I'm also happy for but, questions from anybody. Yes. Yes. Um, do any of these topics that we've been talking about vary by culture or gender or age? Like yeah. any of these topics? Yeah, no, such a good question. And this is probably another one of the uh, common questions we get like, oh, well, this is just so clearly the Western. <laughs> this is the Western way of thinking of selfhood, right? And man, I mean, I am so intrigued by this question and I have very strong competing intuitions because um, we've done a little bit of work where we have, um, you know, we have not sampled, you know, all of the non-Western cultures by any means, but we've done some work like in China and South Korea and India, and we find people still really strongly endorse this idea that following the true self leads to um, good decision-making, right? And there, there's a reason to think that might be true because we think part of this comes from this other, I won't get into it, but this other kind of cognitive tendency we have called essentialism. And we know that that generalizes across cultures. So there, there is one reason to think that it's fairly similar across cultures. That said, um, like I just had a really interesting conversation um, over email that we're gonna follow up on with, um, someone who, who thinks from a, a philosophical perspective about differences between Western and Eastern. And, and just, she basically said, uh, you know that onion metaphor? Our, our metaphor is that when you peel away the onion, there's nothing left. <laughs> there's nothing oh, interesting. in the middle. And so we can like, because, but because Western culture is so influential through TV and movies or whatever, we can kind of walk the walk, but if you really probe deeper, um, there's actually maybe even some anxiety about the fact that there's, once you peel away the onion, there's nothing in there, you know, that yourself is your behavior and there, that's, that's all there is. Um, and so I, I guess my answer is like, stay tuned. I'm fascinated by the question of culture and like, you know, we have some data suggest that it doesn't, but I'm totally open to the idea that we're looking at it in too superficial of a way, you know, that there might be, again, a much more nuanced answer kind of laying underneath the data that we have. Um, we've never really found any differences by gender. Um, again, I don't think that means that they're necessarily not there. We just haven't found any yet. But age, for sure, I think, like I mentioned, actually, um, these, these ideas seem to, if anything, become more important as we get older. Um, but I also think and hope that, you know, with wisdom, with, with as we get older, we do maybe also get more nuanced. Um, and we, you know, again, potentially move away from um, too restrictive. Like one thing I see with the uh, college students, for example, is um, while it's normative to be looking for their self, they really do think there's this one answer, right? And like, once I find it, everything will just lock step into place. I think with more life experience, I don't have data on this, but this is kind of my intuition. <laughs> um, you know, we become a little bit more nuanced in what we think is in that center of the onion, you know, and it's not necessarily just one thing, uh, one set of characteristics. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, how, how long have, has this been a topic of, of serious research? I'm, Curious yeah. how, how all this started, kind of. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think going back to, I mean, forever in some ways, right? Like, while I also think how the self became a problem is like a real thing, I mean, you can look back and see the ancient Greeks are grappling <laughs> with, the, with these things, though, as well, right? So I think it can take different flavors over historical time, right? Um, but I do still think there's also a, get, I love that, how the self became a problem perspective, but I do think there's another sense in which we have been grappling with this forever. And certainly uh, throughout the history of philosophy, I think people have been grappling with this and through the history of, I mean, Freud was kind of talking about the true self in different ways. Carl Rogers, I mean, some of our very first psychologists were, I mean, they weren't collecting data that we do now, the way we do now, right? But it, this was baked into their theories, right? And so, um, you know, my answer is forever. <laughs> We've been thinking about this probably <laughs> forever. And uh, you know, I think what kind of our angle has been on it has like, okay, we're like, maybe we're like, we could debate forever again what the exact nature of this thing is. But there's also some value in looking at what it's doing in people's lives kind of independent of the fact of the matter. Like, it's kind of like, uh, you know, scientists love to debate whether there's free will. And that's like a very interesting question. But we also know that believing in free will is pretty important, right? And so to me, like, 
there's some potentially unanswerable questions about what the self really is, but how we construct and think about the self is also pretty darn important because <laughs> um, we're grappling with it, right? And so, so sometimes I like to stay on that side of things in my, I like to think of ponder all of it in my own time. <laughs> but as far as the science goes, uh, what can we learn from thinking about what people are actually doing with these ideas? So I'm at my my final question. Yes. Again, if you have any others, please put them in the chat. But my final question, and again, maybe one of the most important ones from our conversation is how do we find our true our true selves? What are the best ways to do that? Yeah, I wish I had like a really perfect like example. <laughs> I again I'm gonna have some kind of complicated zigzaggy thoughts about this. Uh, but I think you know, my first thought is one is to kind of like to free yourself from the idea that there's only one answer, you know, there's only one answer, you know, again, it might be a more kind of complicated puzzle piece, and there might even be contradicting pieces of who you are, and that's like, okay, right, like, I think having a nuanced and multifaceted view of who you are is important, it's just, you do want to get to that place, though, where it feels understandable to you, you know what I mean, where you, that's where I think that matters, that feeling a connection to your true self is so important, um, but getting there might require kind of freeing yourself from like, uh, we're so used to personality scales, right? And it's like, well, you know, sometimes I'm like this, sometimes I'm like that. Gosh, do I even know who I am? I think it's okay to have conflicting answers because I think who you really are is more again about your values, your intrinsic motives and things like that. So I think a kind of freeing yourself from that is one thing. Um, I think the other thing is just uh, exploration so that you can sometimes integrate these things um, into who you are, you know, so like, uh, whether that's through uh, literature, film, uh, you know, everybody has different places, I think, but like being like, I mean, curiosity, honestly, like playing with ideas, being curious, exploring, I think will really help you get that feeling of knowing who you are. So, and, and I don't, I think that's a little bit different than sometimes what people think is like, oh, I need to just down, I just need to sit down and introspect and yeah. interrogate. And I actually think that might backfire. I think it's actually about kind of going out and playing with ideas experiencing things you know just going on hikes you know just like yeah. doing those things um I think it's kind of half the battle okay two other thoughts about this one is uh kind of like paying attention to getting those kind of tingly feelings paying attention to what you want rather than what society expects of you um is also I think I think a lot of those things can kind of hijack and pull us away from these tendencies. Uh, again, it can also be unhealthy relationships, trauma, basically things that don't nurture our needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Things that pull us away from that, and I think we wanna get back to the situations that allow our more natural growth tendencies to take over. And then another thing that I just use for myself personally, again, it's not something that I have data on, but when you think of the self as your life story as kind of when you put all the pieces together of your life story, how does it fit into a coherent narrative? One thing I just ask myself is like, okay, 10 years from now, 15 years now, from 20 years from now, will I be happy about how I'm kind of spending my time in this chapter? You know, like, will, is this the narrative that I want? And sometimes that reminds me to get back to the like, well, the more meaningful parts of my job, the more meaningful parts of my relationship, and to prioritize those things that I think I really care about. Because I think if I look back and just think I was stressed all the time about having the cleanest house and getting the most papers <laughs> and whatever, I, I don't think I'm going to feel too good about that, right? And so it can be, I think it's, you know, maybe it's like cliche, you know, what what do you want to say that you did when you're on your deathbed? But I think it can be helpful to kind of reflect, you know, time is limited. And am I using, am I making good use of my time? And I think that's a way to kind of, it's not, again, it's not necessarily a, supplying the perfect answer to I am blank, right? But I think it's helping you get in touch with that true self, nonetheless. You know, it's helping you find the things that are meaningful and important to you. Maybe it's more, I feel closer to myself when. Oh my God, or... I love that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think that's exactly right. Um, I, I think, I think you actually just put the nail on the head. It's like, we want to supply an answer to I am blank, but I think it's actually more, I feel closer to myself when I do X, Y, and Z, or when I put myself in situation X, Y, and Z. And so I might steal that. I'm going to use that. It's yours. <laughs> yeah. It's yours. Um, it's totally that. yours. Um, yes. So we have a couple questions here. One is how does sexual identity Ooh. fit into the true self? 
Oh, I love that question. That is so interesting. So another thing that I have no data on, but I do have some uh, intuitions about, um, because I think, you know, I think, you know, there is, this is clearly a place where we can look across history, where I think society has let people convince themselves that there's something that they're not, right? Um, that there is pressure from the outside. And I think while people can sometimes get away with like constructing a narrative that this is who I really am. Um, I, th I think it probably catches up at some point, you know? I mean, I can think about uh, people who I have been close to, you know, for example, who, um, you know, came out later in life and really suppressed <laughs> out of a fear, mostly driven out of religion in this case, but um, it cut up, it took a toll, you know, it took a psychological toll. And I think, um, that again, can be ways to kind of construct a narrative that you think, oh, well, that's part of me, but I really value this more. But I, I think there's a sense in which there that can only get you so far. So so my, I can I have no data, <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's gotta be playing a huge part of, of in there. And, and we know, I mean, that, that people who are, you know, in the closet, for example, I mean, do, that does, we know that that takes a psychological toll. There is data about that. And I think part of it is, you know, feeling that you can't be authentic. Um, so whether you're suppressing it to yourself or to others or both. Uh, so there's this, there's a, another question. How does past, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, epigenics traits oh, fit yeah. into your true self? Yeah, that's, um, that's another good question. Man, that one, I, I don't know. I think it's like, uh, this is probably where my bias comes in too, to think that like, probably it's it's like what you were saying about like I think the true self might even be uh, it doesn't necessarily have content in the way that we normally think of it you know that I, I am x I am y I am z uh but it's like I feel close to my true self when and, and I think even sexual identity might fit into that right like I feel close to my true self when I can express this part of myself and it's a little bit easier to verbalize sometimes than other things um we have some language that surrounds that than other things but um so like, you know, like things that are handed down to us uh, by our parents that are more content or kind of activated by our, our environment in this epigenetic sense. Um, you know, it's like, to me, those are probably like kind of on top of the true self for the most part, you know, cause of, kind of underneath it are, is like our more natural, those kind of more basic growth tendencies for things like autonomy, competence, relatedness, you know? And so it just depends. Um, you know, are those things getting in the way of the satisfaction of those needs? That that seems like a problem. But um, if not, then I think you can work with kind of any traits, introversion, extroversion. Um, I don't know if you have any specific uh, traits in mind, um, but I think it just, you know, you can work with those to, to find that closeness to the true self. Well, I just asked if there's any final questions, but um, thank you so much. Um, this is really fascinating. And I definitely want to have a part two of this conversation um, at some point. But um, thank you so much for all of these insights. It's really, um, it just feels instinctually like this is such an important part of life that maybe as adults, we don't have enough time to think about or to give enough care to. But um, I know, I, I think it's so important. Um, and it like I said, it's the foundation of everything that we're trying to do at the Humane Space. And so um, thank you for the research that you're doing in this area. And we definitely want to check back with you again as you continue your research. Yeah, but I just want to thank you. I mean, it's really fun for me to get, I mean, you know, like to really get, get questions that are different than ones I would get at a conference, you know, or like really <laughs> kind of think, uh, think big than rather like, oh, what about that tea test or whatever? You know, it's like really fun um, to step back and think about the broad things. And um, as you can tell, I have a lot of competing intuitions. So I apologize for kind of throwing so many different ideas in there, but. <laughs> No, I think, I mean, I think what it says to me is that, you know, these are, these aren't perfectly answerable questions. Yeah. It's, right. there's ambiguity there and yeah. um, even competing feelings. And, and I think part of it is just feeling okay with that, feeling yeah. comfortable with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a have a wonderful night. Again, thanks so much for, for joining us. And we'll see you next time in the Humane Space. Mm -hmm.